Hey there, this is Pat Ennis of Ennis Legacy Partners. Welcome to the Exit Readiness Podcast. I'm here with co-host Walter Dial, CPA and tax partner, GRF CPAs and Advisors in Bethesda, Maryland. Our mission here on the podcast is to provide you, the business owner, with subject matter expertise on topics pertaining to building transferable or sellable business value and then planning for your eventual exit from the business. We want to help you build, build a business that's transferable and, and then um, help you to exit successfully on your own terms and conditions. We found, uh, Walter and I found working with business owners that our clients can be some of the most generous people that we know. Generous with their family and friends, generous toward their communities and charities that they're involved with and have a passion and burden for. They're just generous folks, for generally speaking. And and you know, if you've listened to us at all in the past, we've said many times, you've heard us say many times on this podcast that planning for a successful exit involves both business and personal planning issues and exit readiness to realize a successful exit. Well, for those business owners who are indeed charitably inclined, there are some fantastic opportunities for philanthropic planning in advance of an exit. Strategies that can make a significant difference in, in accomplishing your values-based goals and legacy giving goals, as well as goals to minimize taxes, both income and, and, and estate taxes. And we have not met a a business owner yet who wasn't interested in doing that. And so our topic today is five essential tips for donating business interest. And we're ex excited to have with us today guests Lori Roche and Glenn Garbett of Fidelity Charitable. Lori is a director of Complex, Complex Assets Group at Fidelity Charitable, which is an independent public charity that has helped donors support more than 350,000 nonprofit organizations with 60, 61 billion in, in grants. Uh, she's been in her current role since 2019. She has years of experience and technical expertise uh, to serve donors who wanna contribute sophisticated or complex assets, such as privately held business interests to charity. Uh, she works directly with donors, their advisors, their uh, corporate and business lawyers to facilitate these charitable contributions of these complex assets uh, to realize the most favorable tax treatment and uh, the greatest charitable impact uh, possible. And then prior to joining Fidelity in 1999, Lori was an attorney for the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission as, as mentioned, she's an attorney and is also, she's also a certified regulatory and compliance professional and a chartered advisor of philanthropy. And then we have Glenn Garbett, who I've known for years. Uh, he's vice president and charitable planning consultant for Fidelity Charitable. He's been in his role since 2010. I think that's when he and I first met. And uh, in his role, Glenn, he's a tremendous resource on charitable planning for for advisors and their clients in the Washington DC metro area. He, he educates the advisors and on current uh, philanthropic planning trends and strategies and helps philanthropic clients uh, give more and give more wisely to the charities that they're supporting. And prior to joining Fidelity in 2010, Glenn had very, held various other roles at financial institutions like um, MS, MF, MFS Investment uh, Management and Deutsche Bank, along with Fidelity Investments. So here they are, Glenn and Lori. Welcome to the podcast. It's great to have, to be reconnected with some, some Fidelity peeps as I spent 10 years there myself. So thanks for joining us today. We're looking forward to the conversation. Thanks for having us. Great to be here, Pat and Walter. We appreciate it. Thanks, Glenn. Thanks, Lori. Great to see you guys. I guess I'll, I'll start it off. So, you know, when we're working with our with our business owner clients, a lot of times they'll be interested kind of after the fact. They'll go, okay, well, now I've got this pot of money. What can I do to reduce taxes? So, you know, one of our best strategies is just 
put some money in a donor advised fund. And that works out fantastic for people. But are you seeing business owners becoming more aware of things they can do pre-transaction to even get greater tax savings? Or you're not really seeing a lot of traction in that area? Oh, no, we're definitely seeing a lot of traction in that area. Um, the message has definitely gotten out that um, the gold standard when exiting a business and doing your tax planning is to try to make those gifts before the sale. And the reason for that is that you know, the tax benefits are twofold. Not only do you get a deduction for up to 30% of your AGI based on the fair market value of the gift on the date of the gift, but you also avoid the capital gains for the portion of the asset that you've gifted to the charity because you're not selling that portion of the asset. The charity ultimately will participate in that liquidity event. So ultimately, you end up more money goes to um, charity, less money goes to the IRS. Um, and um, it's it's an it's incredible, incredibly powerful tax planning strategy for people who are looking to um, exit their businesses and are looking at a big um, income event. Um, but it is very important that it's done in a timely manner. So, yeah, you know, yeah. So when we talk about those five tips, the first thing is really make sure you're thinking about what you want to do to do your tax planning around the exit and how you want to fund your philanthropy um, early on in the exit process. Yeah. So, so thanks, Lori. So yeah, the five tips and we love giving tips, very practical steps and tips here that listeners can take away. Tip number one, uh, prepare to donate early. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, what? two things about that. How early? That's, that's what an owner is gonna ask. How early? Three weeks, three months, three years. And then what does the donating look like when it's complex assets like a business interest, privately held business interest? Yeah. So I like to say it's never too early, but it can be too late. Um, so I would say that if you know that you're in the process of collecting LOIs, you know that your intention is a sale of some of your equity, whether it's a full exit or a partial exit from your from your company, um, you know, at that time, start talking to your advisors about what am I going to do to plan around um, this, this liquidity event and this capital gain event? And if you are philanthropic, at that time, start reaching out to the different sort of charitable vehicles you might be considering to make a contribution to. Um, on, on our end, I can tell you from my experience, making a gift can take, you know, five to 10 business days. It, it's, it's something that can be done relatively quickly, but there's a lot to consider and a lot of education that as a business owner, you should, um, you know, learn about the process, learn about the footfalls of this type of giving so that when it comes time to make the gift, it is smooth. So I would say, um, you know, when you're in that, when you know you're marketing, you know there's going to be a sale, um, that's when you start having the conversations. Mm -hmm. And yeah. then, yeah. And then on our end, you know, what we do is Glenn is always in touch with various, you know, he's he's always available for advisors and donors to, to reach out to and sort of identify those opportunities. And so Glenn usually comes to me um, when an advisor says, you know, I know one of my clients is going to be exiting their business there or they're selling some of their shares pursuant to some sort of retirement event or something like that. And Generally, the process is we have a conversation with the advisor, with the donor, and we usually talk to, you know, most of a lot of the advisory team around, you know, for the donor, we can talk to their CPAs, their lawyers, etc. Um, and we explain to them the process, we explain to them what they need to do, what they need to think about. We have a due diligence process where we review certain, you know, governing documents, financials, things like that. We usually ask to speak with counsel, to talk to counsel about negotiating an actual form of assignment of membership interest or a stock transfer agreement, whatever the case may be. We also talk to counsel about what our transactional considerations will be if and when there is a sale and we're on the cap table as a charity. Um, and we just, you know, and then we, we he really handhold the donor through the process to make sure that it is smooth and to try not to become sort of a fly in the ointment during a very busy, busy time. Yeah. And so, Lori, you mentioned counsel. And so th that would be legal counsel is, is, is you're referring to. 
um, is that both help listeners understand, would that be both a business attorney and or estate planning attorney? Oftentimes I'm I'm talking to both. So the estate planning attorney is really working with the with the donor around modeling out the numbers, figuring out how they want to spread their philanthropic dollars. Um, but it is often very important for us to be in touch with either in-house counsel that really knows the governing documents of the company, what is going to be required for the donor to get approval to make this type of transfer. Mm -hmm. And also even counsel that they've hired to negotiate this transaction. Um, it, it's always helpful for counsel who is in the mix of um, negotiating the transaction with a third party to know there is going to be a charity on, on the cap table. We just mm -hmm. we like to, them to know that because there are certain things that we can't agree to that always fall into these definitive agreements, certain types of indemnification obligations, reps and warranties, things like that. And if, if counsel knows that in advance, they can tell the, you know, the third party buyer, look, we're going to have a charity on board when this happens. Um, and um, these are the types of things they're gonna be looking for carve outs for. And nine times out of 10, those problem, those carve outs are not a problem, but getting that information out in advance, we've found to be very effective. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so yeah, the longer runway, the better, Pat. <laughs> I, would, yeah. I would say a lot of these come to us. We love it when there is that long runway and it's, hey, we've got a, a client who is considering selling their business later this year. And we can talk it all through and kind of work with them on, on, on timing. But so many times um, the advisor isn't told until late in the game. And uh, the, the call comes to me, hey, we, we, here it is Wednesday and there's going to be a definitive agreement signed on Friday. Can we get this done? Mm -hmm. And then it's the fire drill situation. And sometimes they happen and, and oftentimes they don't. So the longer runway, the better. Yeah, and so along those lines, Glenn. Okay, so when we're when we bring on a new exoplanning client, and all of our clients are exoplanning clients. Um, in our discovery process, and on the personal side, we're asking these questions about, you know, are you charitably charitably inclined, and and so on and so forth. And um, and if so, it it it's not unusual for them not have had a conversation with one of their advisors, legal counsel, or even their CPA, other than their annual income tax return, uh, about the potential of, you know, transferring shares of their business into a DAF. Uh, can you give any, before we move on to tip number two, can you, Glenn, because you're working with advisors and clients, uh, would you give an additional tip to to listeners about how to bring this up with their advisors if they're at all interested? Uh, you know, certainly sooner rather than later. Um, and it's yeah. just basically just bringing it up to them, I guess, right? It really is. I mean, for the advisor, it's asking uh, in in the stream of questions that you're 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 when you're doing your fact finding, is philanthropy going to be part of this? Mm -hmm. is, is a natural question to ask. And for the donor, it's just important to mention the whole picture um, because in a lot of cases, this liquidity event will be the biggest uh, monetary event of, of a donor's life. And they have yeah. certain things they want to accomplish. And if philanthropy is going to be part of that, they should certainly mention it to their advisor. Yep. All right, tip number two. Ensure company documentation is in order ahead of time. You know what? One of the things listeners hear from us all the time is you can't start early enough. And it seems like in your tips so far, <laughs> there's that theme. Uh, ensure company documentation is in order ahead of time. Who wants to speak to that? Elizabeth, uh, Lori, you want to speak to that? Sure. So, uh, you know, once you sort of have decided that this is something you might want to do, that you might want to use some of the equity you own in your business at the exit to fund your philanthropy, the next step is really to look at the governing documents to find out, okay, whose approval do I need to do this? When we set up this business, say 15, 20, 30 years ago, what were the rules that we set out? Most of the time, there's some sort of transfer restriction. 
whether it's getting a majority shareholder approval, uh, majority membership approval, um, or sometimes there's things like rights of first refusal where other mm -hmm. members, other shareholders have a right to um, any offer that you receive to, to get in on that event um, or to approve it. Um, sometimes the right of refusal can go to the company. So you wanna know what those are so that you can start socializing the idea of what you're planning on doing with those people, the people that are going to need to approve it. Mm -hmm. um, and I, my, in my experience, you know, we get on the phone with an advisor and a donor. Um, they start talking about this theoretically. Once we sort of explain it to them, they do. They go talk to their CFO. They go talk to um, their board about this is an opportunity. And the next thing I know, we're on the phone with, you know, all of the shareholders of the company because they think, well, this is really great. Um, so most of the time, those types of transfer restrictions are not problematic, but you do want to socialize that idea with the people that are responsible for giving you that approval early. Yeah, and those documents that um, you're referring to would include the operating agreement or um, 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 corporate documents and, and, and maybe a buy-sell agreement if there's a buy-sell mm -hmm. agreement. Any yeah. other documents that come to mind other than those? Um, usually it's, you know, articles of incorporation, bylaws, shareholder agreement. Um, sometimes um, the documents are, you can have a separate right of first refusal or a buy-sell agreement. Anything that governs the ownership of the asset. Because yes. the other thing to remember is from the charity's perspective, when we accept the gift, we're going to be subject to all of those documents, all of the rules of the road of the entity that you were as, a, as an equity holder. So we are going to want to see everything that applies and that, that applies to us as a charity when we own, own the asset, which is, a, which is another point from the, from the you know, charity's perspective, there might be provisions within those documents that the charity can't agree to. You know, um, in order for a gift to be completed and you know, recognized by the IRS as valid, uh, the, don the, do the uh, charity has to have uh, full discretion over the asset. There can be no control by the donor or the entity about when the charity sells the asset, what the charity does with the asset. So if there's provisions inside the agreements that say that the company has is uh, has the right to you know, buy back the shares at any time under any condition, that could be a problem and we might need to be carved out of that. Once we explain the reason for asking for that carve out, usually it's not a problem and it's approved, but again, that's another reason to know what those documents say in advance. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Okay, so tip number three, here we go again, don't procrastinate. Don't ignore the appraisal requirement. And don't yeah. procrastinate. Yeah. So talk about yeah, the, the two big foot faults we see all the time is uh, timing when people wait too long, they've already signed the definitive agreement. When that happens, you know, the donor has essentially lost the ability to avoid the capital gains. That's why timing is really important in making the gift. The second is the appraisal requirement. Um, people aren't really aware of this requirement. It's a requirement that the IRS has for gifts of privately held assets to charity. The fair market value that the donor is going to use for the deduction has to be based on a qualified independent appraisal. Mm -hmm. So that is something that that is, you know, something the donor will need to engage with an appraiser. They will need to have that prepared. There's likely a cost associated with that. Sometimes that, that takes people by surprise and causes some hesitation on the part of the donor, but nine times out of 10, even with the cost associated with the appraisal, when you're looking at an event this big, it's still gonna be very tax efficient to, to go this route. Um, and you don't need to have the appraisal you know, before you make the gift. That's the other thing people say when I'm on the phone with them. I've got so much going on right now. I've got lawyers involved. I've got CPAs involved. I don't need to get another third party involved in this. Well, you can wait until the transaction is completely done, engage an appraiser. They will look at what was known or knowable on the date of the gift for purposes of, you know, providing the fair market value. Um, but you don't need to have it while you're in the mix of, of all these things going on. You mm -hmm. do need to have it when you go to claim the deduction the following year, and you need to attach it to uh, form 8283 that you use to claim that deduction. Mm -hmm. Very good. Walter, as a certified valuation specialist, do you have any drill down questions about that piece? No, I've had to do a few um, in this scenario, but yeah, it is. I mean, I've had I've had some where, you know, they contact me 
way after the whole transaction because they realize they got to repair their tax return and attach the attach the form to their return to get the deduction. Um, but other than that, no. But it is a, it is a critical piece for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and it is better. I mean, you don't necessarily if you engage your appraiser early, have a conversation with your appraiser early, try to understand the methodology they're going to use. And sort of their philosophy around discounting, right? Because they are going to apply some discounts. So the fair market value that you use for your deduction isn't necessarily going to align to the sale price of the equity. Um, and you want to understand how what their thoughts are around how they apply discounts. Those discounts are for things like lack of marketability and minority share interest. Mm -hmm. But when you have LOIs and you have, um, you know, draft purchase agreements on the table, those types of facts help with minimizing sort of lack of marketability deduction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I would just stress the importance of getting a real valuation. You know, right. your, your, your friend who uh, does his own tax return can't do your valuation for you. <laughs> you know, you need a real valuation firm or a real valuation expert. And I have seen these get in the way, as Lori mentioned, you know, um, it might take a donor by surprise that they have to get evaluation, which again can be done after the sale. So it won't get in the way of the sale, but um, you know, the donor will have to pay out of pocket for it. And they're not crazy about that, but it, it helps the whole process and is necessary. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, hey, Lori, um, let, let me ask this question while I'm thinking about it so I don't forget. You don't procrastinate, start early, start as early as you can. If you, Lori, were, were going to do this, you had a privately held business and you were thinking of employing this strategy, how far out in advance would be your minimum of starting to prepare? Um, I would say, you know, probably at least three weeks before you think you're going to be closing on the transaction, three or four weeks before you're going to be closing on the transaction. I mean, ideally, you you start thinking about it when you're getting those LOIs um, because there are so many advisors you want to talk to about it, right? You want to model out the numbers. You want to engage with your appraiser. So, but if, you know, if, if it has come to the point where you haven't had this conversation with your advisor yet and you're already in the thick of negotiating a transaction, you want to give the charity and counsel enough time to make sure the gift is done before you're putting pen to paper. So I would say, you know, you want to build in at least a couple weeks before you're, you're signing any definitive agreements. And one thing people often uh, misunderstand is that, you know, it's if it's not a sign and close type deal, they think, well, you know, we can sign and we're not closing for another 30 days. So we can make the gift after we sign. That's not the case, or at least that's not our interpretation of, of the timing. You know, our interpretation, you know, at Fidelity Charitable has always been that, you know, you, once you sign that definitive agreement, the IRS is likely to say that, you know, for all intents and purposes, this transaction is complete. There might be some contingencies that are sort of um, standard contingencies um, and if that's the case, then, you know, the IRS is going to say the income is already vested in you as the donor and you cannot now give away the asset and avoid the capital gain. So those are types of things that people I see people make those types of um, mistakes and thinking of and in, in trying to interpret interpret the timing of when to make the gift. Yeah. So wouldn't you say, though, that that three weeks, I mean, that that's that's a time frame for the actual transaction, if you will. Yes. But but planning for this, you started off our conversation today. There's so much to think through. I mean, from an income tax perspective and estate planning perspective, both tax and just, you know, where do I yeah. want wealth to go? Yeah. And then, and, then, right. and then all of that impacts my personal financial plan and, and things like retirement and everything else. So that yeah. can take, you know, that can take years sometimes. Yeah, and 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 when you're thinking about, you know, if you've decided that you do want to be philanthropic, you know, to your point, it's not just about how do you go about it operationally, right? What are the steps to do it to make the gift? It's also about where do I want to give? Mm -hmm. um, what kind of vehicle do I want to use? 
what are my goals from a philanthropic perspective? Um, am I looking at, you know, creating a family foundation type thing? Is this going to be a legacy that I want to leave to family members to manage and be compensated for managing these funds? Mm -hmm. Or am I looking at, you know, or am I not sure? And so what I want is to be able to um, make the gift and have my funds grow over time while I determine what my philanthropic goal is. So to your point, the sooner you start thinking about your philanthropic goals and what types of vehicles make sense for you, the better. And that, that usually that does take a lot of time because the best way to do that is to have conversations with lots of different folks who might be, have been in your position before as a philanthropist, as a philanthropist um, and, you know, advisors who have worked with different charities. So it is important to, to start that part of the planning early. Yeah. And so that, that, uh, plays into tip number four, which is choose your charitable giving strategy carefully. And, 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 and that would include the different vehicles. Mm -hmm. do, do we create a family foundation? Do we directly contribute to an operating charity? Do we use a DAF? DAF, by the way, uh, listeners, donor advised fund. Uh, so, is there anything else that you would say about tip number four, choose your charitable giving strategy carefully? And whenever we say carefully, that indicates time. <laughs> You're going to do something carefully. Yeah. Well, I think what you really need to do is you need to think about, and this again takes time, um, think about what, what are you trying to achieve? Um, all of the different options are good options, right? Um, but there's different um, benefits and pros and cons to each of the vehicles, right? So for example, if you are planning on using private business interests to fund this phil phil philanthropy, um, there is a difference from a tax planning perspective between using a public charity and a private foundation. So when you give a private asset to a private foundation, your deduction is going to be limited to 20% of your AGI as opposed to 30% if you were to give to a public charity or a donor advised fund. Um, and um, you're also going to be limited to basis in terms of what that, what you're going to be able to um, substantiate that deduction on. So in the case of a you know, privately held asset to a private foundation, you're limited to basis, uh, the, the lower of fair market value or basis. Um, whereas in the gift to a public charity or a DAF, you can get the full fair market value, again, based on that appraisal. So there's obvious, very obvious tax reasons why you might want to choose a, a, a public charity or a donor advised fund as opposed to a private foundation when using privately held assets. Um, but there's also other considerations like, you know, maybe you still you want to have a private foundation because you do have you want your family to be involved in the philanthropy. You want to pass it on to your children. You want to compensate a member of your family for, for managing this money or these, these assets. And that is possible. You can, you know, have both types of vehicles side by side. So, you know, you can fund your, um, your uh, foundation with publicly traded assets, other highly appreciated assets, even cash post-transaction, um, and use the privately held assets to maybe um, you have a donor advised fund as a sidecar to your philanthropic purpose. So, and like you said, you know, making those kinds of decisions, setting up those types of um, arrangements, sidecar vehicles here, there um, does take time. So you want, you want to start planning that sooner rather than later. Lori, can I ask a question about the operation of your donor advised fund? So if you had a private foundation, you have all these requirements to be making a certain level of distributions every year. Does that not apply to your DAF just because it applies to like fidelity overall or something or, or, or does it apply in some way? It does not apply it for donor advised funds don't aren't required currently to have any kind of minimum amount of granting um, as a charity at fidelity charitable. We really see ourselves as a grant making organization. So we do want to encourage our, donors to make grants. Um, so at this time, I our minimum is you need to make at least one grant every two years, is it? Or uh, Glenn, for at least $50. Um, yeah. Yep. Is that right, Glenn? 
That, that's right. And most of your large donor advised funds do have a minimum grant policy these days, Walter, but we're not subject okay. to the same rules as the private foundation. Okay. Thanks for clarifying that. Sure. Yeah. Okay. And then tip number five, coming to an end here, tip number five, utilize experts to help you navigate the process. You've already talked a lot about this, but there's, is there anything else you'd say about and maybe, Glenn, you might have a couple of other thoughts about this, too, because you're working with advisors and their clients so, so regularly. Um, anything else either one of you would say about util utilizing uh, experts? I mean, to me, Pat, it's, it's absolutely necessary when you're talking about some of these liquidity events that can be uh, very large and, and you know, Sometimes we get jaded, you know, a, a, a million dollar transaction to me is a large transaction, but we deal with things, you know, that are in the hundreds of millions as well. Um, but all these decisions that donors make, clients of yours make, um, have consequences and it's best to bring in an expert and sometimes that's a team. Um, <clears throat> so we deal with uh, CPAs, wealth managers, state attorneys, deal attorneys, family offices. And um, generally when a donor comes to us, it's through an intermediary, one of those folks. And, and, and then we are, the next step is if it makes sense, we have uh, a call with Lori. Uh, Lori's team is the complex assets group here at Fidelity Charitable. And we talk it all through with the team. And to me, it's just part of good planning is having good experts. Yeah, and yeah. I would I would say that, you know, like Glenn said, we work with small business owners, we work with big, you know, people who own, you know, multi-million dollar operating businesses, and they usually already have some good advice um, by virtue of running their business. But, you know, if you, if you have um, a business that you've put your heart and soul into, and you're now looking to exit, there are so many things to think about. And so it does make sense to reach out to an advisor to say, okay, like make me a checklist. What are the things that I should be thinking about? Take me through the process, help me understand who else I might need to engage. One of the things that I hear all the time is people don't think about the fact that even though what the money they have tied up in their business is a, most of, or a lot of their portfolio, they don't think about that as an asset they can use to fund philanthropy. Um, they don't think about that as part of their financial portfolio per se. Um, and so having someone to sort of say, listen, these are the different ways you can use your assets that you own that are maybe private right now or illiquid right now to fund philanthropy, to do other things, um, it's just invaluable. Um, because there's a lot of, and there's a lot of footballs people can make. I mean, I, I can't tell you how many times I've had calls where people are very disappointed because they waited too long and they've already signed the definitive agreement or, um, people come back to me three or four years or two years after making a gift and saying, well, I'm having, they're asking me for this appraisal thing. What is that? You know, and <laughs> despite our efforts to educate folks, on the need for the appraisal, still people tend to forget about it or or think that they can use some other sort of internal document to substantiate the deduction. So you do want somebody who really has been through this process, knows the regulatory requirements to hold your hand through it um, because it, it is a great strategy, but it doesn't work if you don't check all the boxes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one thing I will add quickly is there, there can be different ramifications to different corporate structures, as, as, as you all know, an S corp versus an LLC, for instance, or a C corp. Um, so it's important to have experts that have seen uh, transactions with S corps before or C corps or what, what have you. Um, so just adding that in there. Yeah. Yeah. That's a really good point, Glenn. I, you know, I mean, the, the complexity of, making a gift of an S corp for both the donor and the charity versus, you know, a C corp is there's a lot of differences. There are a lot of nuances that have to be considered and worked out. Mm -hmm. Okay. Fantastic. So this has been huge as I know it would be and hugely helpful. I'm sure to listeners um, and in closing in a, in a second, I'm going to ask you guys if there's anything you want to promote today. And if you want to provide contact information but listeners, in summary, 
okay, let's let's prepare to donate early. Let's ensure that your company documentation is in is in good order ahead of time. Don't ignore that appraisal requirement. Get someone like Walter, a certified valuation specialist, to do it. Not just some back of the envelope estimate of value. You need a qualified or certified valuation appraisal. Don't procrastinate on that. Uh, choose your strategy carefully. That takes time too. And then utilize experts that uh, that have the the needed expertise in this in this space. And so that's that's um, the song. Any any last words of wisdom before we before we close out? Either one of you. I, I mean, feel I like we covered it, Pat. But go <laughs> ahead, Lori. <laughs> yeah. I think we've covered it. I think that you know it's important to plan your philanthropy early mm -hmm. and know what your goals are, um, so that when that big event, that visit business exit comes. Mm -hmm. you know how you want to approach it. Fantastic. Okay. Okay. So folks, would you, is there anything that you'd like to promote today from your organization? And then uh, please uh, feel free to share contact information for if any listeners out there want to get in touch with you directly. Uh, you're very kind, Pat. So uh, we're a mission-driven organization at Fidelity Charitable. We run the largest donor advised fund program in in the country um we are a mission-driven organization that simply wants to help americans reach their philanthropic goals um there are plenty of great donor advised funds out there um i would say consult with uh your uh financial advisor your uh estate attorney your cpa um see who they like uh to do some comparison shopping um, we, we hope that you look at us and like us, but there are certainly other great options out there. Mm -hmm. One of the big advantages I would say with um, Fidelity Charitable is that we do have a complex asset group that specializes in these types of transactions. There are five of us in, on the team. Um, we've been doing this for a long time mm -hmm. and we don't charge anything for you know what we do. Um, you have your donor advised fund giving account, you have an administrative fee associated with that, but there's no additional fee for the work we do to work with your advisors to make sure it's a smooth process. So I think that's a huge advantage that we do have over some other sort of donor advised funds out there. Uh, the other thing I will say too, Lori, um, our contact information, you can see our names on the screen. It's uh, a period in between our name at FMR, Frank Mary Roger, FMR.com. So glenn.garbett at FMR.com, Lori Roche, Lori Roche at FMR.com. Fantastic. Okay. Excellent. Thanks so much. Thanks for joining us today. We're really we're grateful for it. I know listeners are going to very much benefit from this conversation. Uh, listeners, if you want help maximizing the value of your business or planning that eventual exit, Few things are absolutely certain in the life of a business owner, taxes being one. Another would be at some point in the future, you're not going to own that business. Uh, you're going to exit it. If you need help in planning for that, you can re reach Walter at 301-951-9090. You can reach me at 301-859-0860. You can access resources at grfcpa.com and exitreadiness.com. Thank you for listening. And until next time on the Exit Readiness Podcast, this is Pat Ennis and Walter Dial signing off.